boy, have I made a lot of mistakes in my life. <sighs> it's hard to even think about. What about you? Maybe you're approaching retirement and you can look back and say, oh, how did I do that? What was I thinking? Well, I'm going to here to tell you, this transition to this new season of life, I think is a perfect time to review the book, learn the lessons, and then close the book and create that new identity for this new season in life. And that, my friends, is what we're going to explore today on the Retirement Answer Man Show. I'm so glad that you are here for week three of discovering who are you going to be in retirement. It's a big life change. And I think closing the book on the past is an important step in creating this new 3.0. I think we're beyond 2.0 at this point. 3.0 of you. Serve me well. I think it will serve you too. So that's what we're going to do today, but we can't do anything before until, well, no, not before, until after <laughs> that all important disclaimer. Don't take advice from me on the show. This is Helpful Hints and Education. Okay, let's get going. How was that? Was that short enough for you? <laughs> You've heard it so many times. All right, in the Hot Topics segment today, I thought I would give you a list of books, resources to help you with this whole transition part of retirement. We got a, plenty of books out there for the money part, and we talk about the money part all the time. But when we're talking about reviewing the past, and then looking forward to the future, there are some books that can help us on that journey. So let's, let's get into this. Number one is by our friend, Dr. Joseph Coughlin, who we heard from last week. The Longevity Economy came out in 2017, unlocking the world's fast-growing, most understood market. So it approaches it from a little bit of an economic spin as he explores this world where people live a long time. It's an excellent book. The work that the MIT Age Lab is doing is really exciting. In fact, I got to talk to him about doing some joint research, which is sort of exciting. So I would suggest that you check out The Longevity Economy so you can help deconstruct this internal narrative you have on what growing old is similar to some of the stuff that we talked about in our longevity series a few months ago. The second book that I would suggest to you, put up for your consideration, is How to Live Forever, The Enduring Power of Connecting the Generations by Mark Friedman. It's almost a classic work now. It's a wonderful book, and it really dives into sort of that meaning, what is my life about in this finite life? And it really connects with a lot of great stories uh, that I think might inspire you to maybe zigzag a whole different direction as you explore how to create a life that's meaningful for you when you're winding down this season of full-time work. So that is How to Live Forever by Mark Freeman. Now, the third book and some of these are going to have some themes, but the last two, I think, are really in regards to this, you know, letting go portion. The third book, and I haven't read this for some time, and I need to revisit it, called Halftime, Changing Your Game Plan for Success to Significance by Bob Buford. And he uses this halftime metaphor as, okay, now you've reached halfway through life or a little bit farther. It's time to reset. Reset your new vision, connect with what's driving you. And in many ways, it's the perfect time to do it. This is, you know, sort of midlife crisis stuff, right? When we're in our 40s, 50s, and sometimes even 60s, we are mature enough and we know a lot more to be able to create a new vision. And his book is a great guide and framework to help you walk through exploring that for yourself. He does it from a Christian mindset or perspective, which I personally appreciate. Whether you do or not, I think 
There's a lot of value in the book, and that is Halftime by Bob Buford. Now, the book number four on our list is much more practical in some ways. In fact, we're talking with one of the co-authors in the last week of this session. It is called Don't Retire, Rewire. And they just came out with a third edition. Jerry Sadler, Spartion, she's a fellow Spartan with me, and Rick Miners, who husband and wife team. And they go through a step-by-step process to find work or for find life that's fulfilling. It's a very practical-minded book. And what I like is it has a lot of exercises you can do throughout the book. Uh, and we'll be talking to her in a week or so. The fifth book on the list is probably one of my all-time favorites by Bob Goff called Love Does Discover a Secretly Incredible Life in an Ordinary World. I don't know how to describe this book other than a call to action to lean in to do amazing things. It's a beautiful book, and he lives a great example. He's a friend of a friend. Well, he's not a friend, but I have friends that are friends of his. I don't know how you say that. But it's really a just a to me, it's a treasure of leading by example and leaning into experience. So I would definitely check that out. The, what, number six book. I always get numbers wrong. You would think I would be really great at numbers. The sixth book on the list, we're actually going to be talking to the author here in a second, and is The Book of Mistakes by Skip Pritchard, which is really outlining, hey, these are, it's a told in parable form. It's actually a very good book for younger people too, not just us old folks. And it talks about, well, you're going to hear in a minute, but It's a great book. The Book of Mistakes, Told in Parable Form by Skip Pritchard. And then the last book on the list, maybe the most important book on the list, it's called Necessary Endings by Dr. Henry Cloud. There are a lot of things that we build up in our lives, relationships, activities, things that we're doing and people that we're associated with that all have a season. And it's very easy not to close those seasons and let them pass. Necessary Endings talks about that, but it also helps give you the tools to identify and navigate what can be very difficult conversations, actions, in order to close out seasons in your life so you are free to be able to move on to the season that you're entering. Probably one of the most recommended books and gifts that I send out or talk to people about. And it really helped me three or four years ago when I was navigating this journey of my business partnership. I had two business partners in our firm and it had been, they're like brother and sister to me, Lorna and Phil. And we had had the firm for 13 years, started from nothing, built it up together. It was all for one, one for all. And the season was ending. And I was the one that recognized it first. And I had to navigate helping close that firm down and ending that season while still preserving two very important friendships in my life. And the book was a big part of that, along with a lot of wise friends. It it was a storybook ending to that season, and I think this book was a big help with that. And I think it might help you as you are closing down the season of work and figuring out what things are coming to an end and how do I navigate those. So it's a great book from that perspective. With that, let's move on to our conversation with Skip Pritchard. If you are in the season of navigating away from full-time work to retirement and all that means financially, personally, socially, sometimes it's good to have some foxhole buddies of people that are on the same journey that have the same spirit. And that's what we got in the Rock Retirement Club. We got some amazing group of people that all are very kind, very smart, and very intentional. And we get to share stories and discuss openly and safely 
how to make this transition to rock retirement. So if you're interested in a group like that, plus world-class education on how to retire from me, go to rockretirementclub.com and you can check it out. We have open enrollment and we'd love to see you in there if it's a good fit. I'm really excited to be having this conversation with you, me, and Skip Pritchard today. He is the real deal. He's a business leader. He is a just a wonderful man. And the book, The Book of Mistakes, is a great story. It's a really easy read. And I think it's a perfect time to think about these things as we're transitioning and closing the book on, you know, a lot of past that we gain some wisdom from. So let's have a conversation with Skip Pritchard. My first question was, why did you choose to write in a parable form? It's sort of similar to Andy Andrews. I just read The Traveler's Gift, sim- you know, same type of structure. What drew you to that? Right. And I was so pleased that Andy wrote a nice comment yeah. on the back of the book. You know, writing a story form is interesting. I'll tell you why. I read a lot of books, at least one a day, usually two and sometimes three, because I have horrible insomnia and I'm a very quick reader. I read a lot of nonfiction. And the problem is a lot of nonfiction can get dull. And my daughter, I was writing this book. I was thinking, what do I want her to think about this book? And I wanted her to read it. And she'd be bored to tears. The problem with writing a book in this format, to be honest, due respect to people who, like Andy Andrews who are at the top of their game writing these books, they're very hard to write. Meaning I get them all the time in the mail from publishers and they're often very boring stories. So, well, it, <laughs> you don't it, want to write a boring book, whether it's a story or whether it's nonfiction. Does it engage the reader? And so I'm fortunate, very pleased, because I never knew. I thought, well, would this be in which category? And people are engaged in the story. But people remember stories. One researcher, Jennifer Aker in Stanford, said, you remember stories 22 times more than you do facts. There's numerous studies, brain studies, talking about the hormones that your brain releases that help you actually remember the facts. So there's kind of a scientific backing from that. And it engages. I wanted to, you know, uh, Jerry Seinfeld's wife, I love these cookbooks she has out for kids or parents of kids that sneak in like zucchini into chocolate chip cookies, (laughs) which would be about the only way that when I was a kid that you would ever get me to eat zucchini. And I wanted to write a book like that, like sneaking in these things so that even if you were just reading it for entertainment, you'd enjoy that experience, which was kind of the goal of the book of mistakes. Storytelling is definitely an art. And I think you you hit it well there. So, And I think that's one reason why metaphors and analogies, which I abuse, are helpful, right? Because they create those images to the to the lesson that you're trying to express. It's true. And even if it's a nonfiction book, it's the stories that we remember in that book that makes it compelling that you say, wow, that's interesting. Whether it's a podcast, whether it's a blog, whether it's a book, whatever it is, I know I often remember the context so much better if you give me the color and paint the picture than if you just said, follow these five steps. That's probably not going to be, I'll forget. I'll have to write it down. Right. Right. And it will make sense at the time, but then it just goes away. It doesn't resonate. The subtitle to this book is about a successful future. So I guess that begs the question, especially for us, where we're over 50, we are entering a different season of life where we're not trapped by, you know, the normal career building, raising children, how we organize our life. How do we define success? I mean, I assume your definition has to be pretty important. It does. And I'll tell you, the people that are resonating most with this book, surprisingly, are at all different ages, which you say, well, if you know, every author says that, but all different ages, but they have something in common, people at inflection points. And that's one of the things that surprised me about the book. It's people that are just graduating and they're, they're getting this book or people who are just starting a new job or people just starting a new business or people just retiring or looking forward to another transition. So success to me is the maximization of all of your God-given talents for your own future. But success is also the balance and this 
equilibrium between having peace and also having this aspiration at the same time. I say it somewhere in the book, but in a much more eloquent way. But keeping those two things together is so very important that you still aspire to more, and yet you're also at peace. And that balance is a magical balance. I still drive. I still want more, but I don't need more in order to be happy. I'm fulfilled and I'm successful, but I'm also driving for more because we're meant to grow. We're not meant to be stagnant. We're not meant to just stop and do nothing. We're not meant to atrophy. And in fact, if we stop, we, we do, whether it's our physical bodies, whether it's our mental acuity, whether it is business, whatever it is, failure to exercise those dimensions will make you atrophy. I think that's a great definition and really important for people thinking about a transition to, I mean, we use the word retirement. The reason I use the word is just because it's the word, but it's a horrible right. word. It should be a four letter word, but you know, that's the word that we use. And it really ends up being more about life time freedom, because it's one of those, you know, it's sort of like when you graduate college, you can organize your life any way you want. You don't have much experience to know how you might want to organize it. You can go live where you want. You can do what you want. You can live where you want. And then you get into sort of this family cycle where we feel like we're in lanes of what we're supposed to do. And then retirement is sort of that next season of now you actually have resources and wisdom to organize your life any way you want. And that's where I think a lot of the stories that you bring in about how you define that and what success is really important, right? Number one, you don't want to let other people define it for you. Live no, their dream. Absolutely true. And I, I think hopefully people in retirement have the resources and time. Yes. That's yeah. not always the case. Uh, more and more, I think that's becoming a challenge and people are trying to figure out how to make ends meet. But the ability to change your future is extraordinary. And there's no better time to create a better future than right now. And it doesn't matter. You know, people are like, oh, well, I'm at this age or I'm too young or it doesn't matter when. You can start that whole new life. I mean, one of the most famous examples that people use all the time, my daughter's an artist. You think about Grandma Moses and she was 78 and she started this career. Well, these young artists, she's uh, an artist, often think, you know, oh, when should I start? It doesn't matter. You can create this. You can create a business. You can create a life. You can design your life uh, for tomorrow starting today. What better time? Yeah, you don't want other people. The, the very first mistake is working on someone else's dream. And we find so many times in our life we've drifted and we drift and we go, why am I here? And it's because we've worked on someone else's dream. It, it may be a business that we've always wanted to create. It may be a book we want to write, a song, a piece of art we want to paint, what, whatever that is. We need to let that come from within us and, and get it out instead of just simply drifting along. You know, we'd say, how'd I get here? Well, I started this job and then this happened and that happened and it just sort of unfolded. Well, that's fine. Is that where you want to stay or do you want to design your life now to change to where you want to go? And so these transition points are so fantastic for you to just stop, reflect and think, is this giving me joy? Is this what I want? Is this where I want to go? Or do I want to make a change? Do I want to just alter? And, and often I find that the slight changes in degrees has this huge impact over time. So you don't always need to have this radical change, though I applaud those if that happens, but change a little, change a few degrees and what a measurable difference that makes. There's the, I forget her name. It was the Australian hospice nurse that talked about the biggest regrets people have at the end. And number one on the list was living a life based on what other people expected of me. Actually, she was one of the first. There are many studies on dying. And in fact, these nine mistakes that I developed came from me interviewing over a thousand people, came from my experience as a CEO, but each one of them is backed by a lot of research. And this one is directly connected to that research from the dying and this regret. I wish I would have lived a life true to me instead of for everyone else. And working on someone else's dream is a direct reflection. So you're right to pick right up on that, which is all this research. And that's what we do, right? So often, 
and we don't even realize it. We're not doing it consciously, oh, obviously. No. Yeah. It's just drift. It's just drift. And we, you know, we majored in this because our parents wanted to, and that put us into this job. And then our first boss encouraged us to go this way because that's what they did. I mean, so often it's somebody else taking their dreams and saying, oh, I wish I would have done this. So I'm going to put it on my kid to be the famous baseball player. And then you're stuck in someone else's dream. And you're like, hey, I didn't want that. Yeah. Um, and for a baby boomer, a lot of times it's you get really good and competent and rewarded for work that you really don't enjoy. <laughs> and, you know, and now you have all these responsibilities and this is your, you know, and what I find, and I'd be interested in your view with this book of, then we start to view retirement from, I have to escape this life I've created rather than creating a compelling vision of personal growth that you're running towards. It's much worse, I would think, to run oh, away wow. from something. Beautiful. I actually wrote a post about moving towards and not away. When I interview people for jobs, if I ask them this question of, you know, why are you applying to work for me? If they give me the, the answer, I'm moving away. I don't like the situation. Here's the situation I'm in. If the bulk of their answer is around that, I know I'm not going to have the best tire. Whereas if I'm moving to you, because here, here's what I saw. I, I want to work for you for these reasons. I'm compelled by this mission and I'm swept into it. Now we're talking, right? If they're sincere, you're much better off finding somebody moving towards something. And what are you moving? I, I experienced this throughout life where I've, I've met people that are like, well, I'm stuck in my job because I have great benefits and I can't leave it because of this. And I'm vested this many years and I'm this and that and the other. And those are just excuses. Now, if you're in your job and, and those are reasons why you love your job, more power to you. Right. So that's fabulous. You could say, Hey, these are reasons I love my job. I'm vested. I'm this, that, and the other. But what else? Right. Is there a burning fire in you? And I love people that love their jobs. That's fantastic. I want people to love their jobs and be so passionate about it that they're on fire in their job. I'm not a believer that everybody has to launch their own business. Some people, sure. Some people, not. The key is what's right for you and are you passionate about it? Is it your dream? Are you fulfilled? And if you're not, then figure out a new way. Yeah, I think retirement ends up being that false goal of I will enjoy my life then. I will be happy then. I will have time then. And then you get there and you don't have that vision and then you get you get lost. Yeah. And, yeah. and so many times there's not a burning why. There's and, and therefore the what doesn't really materialize because the why has to be first. And then you see people in trouble fast. Yeah, um, yeah. They're spinning. They're very, they go into depression. Many times they die. I mean, it's, it's a horrible thing. So you know, work on your why. And, and there's so many things that you could do. It's incredible. And experiment. I think that's such a big thing is to take some time in your life where I tell people, why not take a year where you're just trying things. You know, I've never taken a, a music class. Well, I don't, I'm going to try guitar. I'm going to take an instrument. I'm going to start going to shows. Like whatever it is, it expands your mind. It can't hurt you. And you may find something that just pulls you in. Keep looking for that. Keep looking for the things that really drive you. It's worth it. And the key is being on your toes, doing it, not just thinking it's going to come to you. So, you know, I got to ask the question, <laughs> Skip, is what are you working towards when you think of you? What am I working yeah. towards? Well, each and every day for me, it's, am I challenging myself? Am I learning more? And am I impacting people? I want to inspire people. I want people to be changing and grabbing a better future. I'm so inspired. I mean, for me, I help organizations and individuals aim higher to achieve impossible breakthroughs. That's my mission statement. And I'm so inspired when I see people doing that. So all parts of that, can we get them to aim higher and do something different? Can we achieve some kind of breakthrough in the organization at work or individually, a team? That's just so inspiring to me. And so any way I can do that and help people with those light bulbs that go off that says, you know what? This idea really helped me and changed my direction. That to me is so incredibly inspiring. So I'm always looking for more opportunities to do just that. So it's interesting. How does one, I don't think it happens naturally for most people, disconnect the financial success from what you just described? 
of working really out of this is what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm trying to express my gifts and grade yourself on these less quantitative things than I'm able to make more money and get the promotion and things like that. I know that's important, but at some point it's never enough. What's never enough? The, the, the money, money or part of it, the financial, which is usually the driver of a typical business structure. Yeah, it is. And I'm one that always thinks that money is a byproduct. I never have aimed at money. And if you're aiming at becoming, the money follows. And so Jim Rohn early in my career said, work harder on your self than you do on your job. If you work hard on your job, you'll make money. If you work hard on yourself, you'll make a fortune. Change my life. Because if you consistently and constantly are working on yourself, it changes everything. Your capacity grows. You started a job, you're working for money, you're in trouble. Zig Ziglar always used to say this story of this uh, president of the railroad that stopped. If you heard this one, yeah. and yep. he would stop and he would ask him, you know, how come you're the, he's, you know, started on the same day. Well, why is that? He's the president of the railroad and you're still working here. He said, the difference is I went to work for whatever, a dollar an hour. And he went to work for the railroad. The idea is the spirit within is so much more important. Money is just a byproduct. Bob Berg says money is the echo of value. It's important. It's something that we all need to uh, get through the world. And yet, if that's your focus only, right? If the bank account's the focus, the people that I've seen that are in trouble. And often because I have found that the more open I am with that, money, the more flows into my hands. And if I grab it and I'm constantly looking at pennies and nickels, I've been through periods of my life like that. Haven't we all? Less, <laughs> right? Less and less come in. And then when I open it up and say, you know, I want to give some of this, more and more flows in. And so I've been all those things, right? I've been broke and I've had plenty of money. It's more fun to have money, I must say, than to be broke. But I also know that if I had lost all the money I have today, I could recreate it in a very fast way because money is simply a symptom, not the key. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I see in what we we're talking about with vision and moving forward, I see that when people are considering a life change where they want more time freedom, but absent of vision, it always makes sense to work one more year. You know, there's inertia because we're used to it. A reward system is there and lacking a vision. They just keep accumulating more and never even explore what a vision could be. Which is pretty sad. Yeah, it's so true. And often you might just start your vision part time. You know, I always tell people that there was like, I'm going to quit and do this, that, and the other. And I talked to one couple and they were both going to quit their jobs, young children. And I thought, you know, this is probably not a good idea. Maybe it is, right? There's stories of people who go out and they have to risk it all because that's what drove them. And so that that is certainly possible. But be careful. It may be that maybe one of you should keep the job and the benefits while the other one is exploring and learning and, and trying and doing these things. And you can help part-time. And I came from a philosophy that you want to wait until your part-time income is greater than your full-time income before you make that switch. But everybody has a different lever. And and I appreciate everyone's different journey and decision-making process. So how do we deal with what you talk about with the, you know, the story of the penny and the label? Yeah. Of, you know, when you are working, it, it's very normal that we define ourselves by what we do. If I was to meet you at a party, probably that's one of the first questions that's a normal, hey, what do you do? Which is sort of who you are. That's basically what the question is. And when you think of leaving, quote unquote, your career, that's scary because you're, you've attached yourself to that label. How do you navigate that? I mean, how do you personally navigate that? And I'm assuming you've had to deal with that. First of all, I never attach myself to a job. I never have and I don't. I don't make my identity my job. And the reason is I saw relatives who did that and the results were disastrous when that job went away. I don't usually even say I'm a CEO. I'm proud of our organization. We have a wonderful company that uh, has a great mission for libraries and I'm passionate about it. But Oftentimes people ask me what I do. I say I'm in sales because we're all in sales, right? We're all selling something, ideas, et cetera. Or I say I'm here to, I'm here to inspire. So it is important. The second mistake is allowing someone else to define your value. And you don't want someone to put a label on you that limits you. 
unnecessarily. And so, you know, business, it makes sense, even if you think about coffee, right? Coffee was on this downward trend to quarter, nickel, cheaper and cheaper. Starbucks came along and redefined it to five bucks. And then now I think that's cheap if you can find one for $5. It's this this value. You can't let people put their value on you. You have to be very careful that you're defining yourself in the way that you want to be, in the way you define it. And it's a very personal thing. You have to see, you know, what's my mission statement? Where am I going? What gives me energy? What do I want to be known for? How do I want to achieve these things? You can't just let someone else slap these things on you. It's too limiting. And be careful which one you slap on yourself, right? And be careful which one you slap on yourself. See, That's I, true. I, I, I like labels like Nicole, who is on our team. I guess you would call her an executive assistant. She has two titles. One is awesome sidekick or rock star. I like those kind of labels. <laughs> I do too. And you know what though? We don't remember them, right? We remember when somebody said you were horrible at soccer. That's what we remember. We don't usually remember the awesome ones as much. And so we have to replay those. We just have a tendency to not remember them. And so I think it's very important to think about that. You know, the very first team that I led in one company we were the last in the company. We were branded as the losers. And I had everyone go around. I was so proud to get the job. I realized later I got the job because nobody else wanted it because it was the last team. <laughs> and we went around the room and I had everyone write down why we would not be number one that year. And they kind of laugh like, well, you know, we're the last team ever. We're always the losers. They all wrote down, you know, and write down the reasons why we went around. I took all that and I threw it into a bucket in the middle of the room. Since learned, you're not supposed to light uh, things on fire <laughs> in office buildings, but I lit it on fire. And I said, now write down all the reasons why we're going to be number one. And we burned this list. These were negative labels. These were things that people had that said, you know, we're not going to win because of these reasons. And I said, let's write what we are. And we kept the labels of what we wanted to be. And we burned these other, he said, well, that's hokey and silly or whatever. Well, it worked. We were number one that year. Number one. I ran into one uh, vice president at the end of the year at the meeting. And he says, how you doing? I said, we're number one. He's like, you're number one in the region. I can't even believe it. I said, no, we're number one in the country. And he was like visibly stunned. That wasn't me, right? That was all of us looking at our labels, pushing that aside, relabeling it, thinking, how do we want to be? Because you have to first think about what you want to be before you ever think about how you're going to do it. So I have one last question for you. And it's a quote from the beginning of your book. And I want to read it so I don't mess it up. Readiness is when desire is stronger than your distractions. So a lot of us, you know, obviously readiness is that sort of, the, you know, the teacher will appear when the student is ready. A lot of us think we want to be students and we flirt with it, but we still let the distractions distract us. Is that a process or how do you get over that? Because we're in a distraction kind of world. Oh, we really are. Oh, wait, there's a, no, <laughs> it's, it's a constant battle. And the reason I put that in there before the journey even starts is that too many people think, well, I'm ready to get going, right? New Year's, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get in shape. And we think, well, because the calendar changed and we are, you know, that we're ready. We're not ready. Readiness is when our desire is greater than our distractions. So if you want to start and have this meaningful physical change, you have to get ready. And there's two parts of that equation. So whether you're losing weight, whether you're launching a business, whether you're going into retirement, it's readiness is this two-part equation for me. It's readiness is when my desire is greater than my distraction. So first, I'm going to think about my desire. And so you think about what do I want? And I'm going to write that down. What do I want to be known as? Or what things do I want to buy? Some people are like, I, I want this new car. Well, put it on the refrigerator right? Other people are like, I, I want freedom. Well, what does that look like to you? Thinking about the desire part is very important. We, we do that. We te- Sometimes we daydream about that, but daydream and then put it down, write it down, journal it out, be very specific what that looks like. And the second part is your distractions, right? And this is when your desire is greater than your distractions. So what are the distractions, right? For one person who lost incredible amounts of weight, she told me, 
I took that formula and I got rid of all the distractions in my house that were distracting me as I was thinking about eating throughout, mostly for her, she said it was late night eating. So limiting those distractions, what are they? you got to anticipate them. You can't pretend they're not going to be there. So it may be I'm launching a business and my distractions are, my cousin is always just saying, well, why do you want to think you could do that for? You know, you then need to limit some time with that cousin, right? Whatever the distractions are, be very prescriptive, be very deliberate about them and think, I'm not going to pretend these distractions don't exist. I'm going to manage them and I'm going to manage them proactively, purposely, and as strongly as I will this other side of the equation. It's not just about a dream of, okay, I'm going to do this or that and the other. You've got to manage both sides of those equations. And if you haven't prepared for that, you're not ready to launch. And if you're not ready to launch, don't. I think a key one with those distractions is that what comes to mind is lead me not to temptation. And the, the one thing I did when I was early in this journey of a lot of what you talk about is... In our office, I turned my desk around so my back faced the door because I knew if people walked by, they would stick their head in or a casual conversation would start. Not that those aren't great, but I knew that I couldn't control them. So just the simple act of removing the distraction helped a lot. It helps a lot. Some people are using, you know, productivity apps, removing their phones, limiting these kind of things or whatever, because we do live in this world where, well, let me just check what's trending or did anybody yeah. do this or does anybody like this? And, you know, social media and phones are just huge uh, ability to to pull us off course and distract just us. Just acknowledging, so you, I am not strong enough. I am a weak human. <laughs> is, exactly. Helps a lot. It does help a lot. And that's the journey. So I agree with you. And shut the door. I mean, it's it's one thing that we all have to think about leading organizations. Oh, I have an open door policy. You can come in anytime or whatever. That's a recipe for disaster. Shut the door. <laughs> if you want to have it open, have open door time and make it proactive. And this is exactly what it's for. Then when you come in, I'm not annoyed by you. I'm delighted to have you here because if I'm not fully present anyway, then that's a disaster for both of us, right? So if you were facing the other way and somebody comes by and you're visibly annoyed and stressed because they're stopping, that's not helping. Yeah, that's not, that's not helpful either. The idea of these ideas of things that we want, you know, the desire part of it. What I heard, and tell me if I heard this correctly, is we have lots of desires of what something might be, but they sort of float around. And I think it's up to us to lean in and explore them more because- that's where, you know, a lot of time you talk about creating a vision. You don't just sit down one day and create a vision. It's something you got to noodle on for a while. So you got to grab those fleeting thoughts and nurture them and see if they grow enough to really take root. You That's know, true. And also ask yourself why you want it. And I always tell people, ask why several layers deep. Sometimes you say, well, I want um, a new car. Why? I want to impress the neighbors. Why? You start getting to the why behind it, and then you realize, you know what? I really don't care about that. Or I want to lose this weight. Why? Well, I have this reunion coming up. Why does that matter to you? I mean, you have to get into the psychology behind it because that's going to uncover itself subconsciously anyway. Better to know that going in. And you may go, you know what? I'm going to let that go. I want to write a book. Well, why? And it may, well, I want to make a million dollars because I didn't save any money in retirement. Is that likely? And so <laughs> you want to ask the why uh, be, behind As a man who's written a book, no, it's not. It's not likely. <laughs> it's not likely. It, I mean, it's possible, but there are probably other ways to uh, achieve your goals that are probably better. Yeah. I'm really excited to dive into this book, not just with the Rock Retirement Club, but also with my two uh, early 20-year-old kids. We're going to do a weekly book study on it as well. Well, thank you. It's fun to write and the response has been amazing. It's been fun to watch it now getting translated in languages all over the world, <laughs> seeing these you... covers come in and <laughs> very creative, very creative. Thank you so much, Skip. Thanks for having me. Hey, welcome to the Happy Lab. I don't know why I'm talking in this voice. So excited to, because it makes the cold laugh. You're so happy you got high pitched. <laughs> I got high pitched. Welcome to the Happy Lab, where we noodle on how to live a happier life. And this is sort of the show of mistakes and closing these things out. So, Nicole, mm. what is a big mistake 
not big mistake, but what's a mistake that you thought was a mistake that ended up good? I would say I thought it was a mistake at the time, and I'm less sure now that it was a mistake, although my husband thinks it was, us relocating to DFW. <laughs> On paper, financially, yes, it probably was a mistake, but I feel like we both learned a lot from it. Um, I met you, so that was kind of a plus. Yeah, you better not say that was a mistake. Are you right? Yeah, I guess it was a mistake. And in the, in the moment, it didn't make me very happy, like that first few months. But now looking back on it, I'm glad that we did it. I think it was a valuable mistake. And happiness doesn't always feel like happiness in the moment, right? It really doesn't. And I think a lot of the mistakes that I've made have ended up being pivotal points in my life, usually for the good, for the better. But I don't right. know that until 10 years after the fact. I mean, it almost like forces you to change a little bit and otherwise you might just coast along and stick with the status quo, right? Yeah. And and, and I don't know if you had this. It's interesting. Those mistakes, when I think back of them, I had a good period of time where there was a ro- lot of regret and self-recrimination, incrimination. You would know. Recrimination. Recrimination <laughs> of just beating myself up about them for a very long period oh. of time. Well, and how did you get past it? I don't know. Actually, you're still beating yourself up right now, aren't you? <laughs> Literally, as we talk. No, I'm actually, I think I've, you know, I think mentioned the book Atomic Habits last month. That book was not around, but I really, over the last five, six years, have changed how I view things and how I deal with things. I'm in a much healthier place than I was during those times. But I think it's normal to beat yourself up for a period of time. But at some point, and I think this goes to this show, is if you really want to be happy and you discover this new identity, Retirement's a great time to start to put to bed some of that baggage that we've created over 50 plus years on this earth because we all have it. And I think that's one way to be happy going forward. This was a really good happy lab. You like that? A happy? for real one. Yeah, it was a for real one. No silliness. Well, a little bit. On your marks, get set. <laughs> and we're off to sit a seven day goal to take a baby step to rock retirement. <gasps> That's a take. Bravo. That's a take. Okay. So in the next seven days, spend some time being real with yourself and identifying some things that you need to close the book on. Forgive yourself for it. Give yourself a lot of grace. Grace is a wonderful thing. She's a nice lady too, but it's a wonderful thing. Spend some time It may take more than a week, but it's well worth the effort. So we talk about all these mistakes, Nicole. There's a lot of mistakes that I'm too embarrassed even to share on the show. I'm usually pretty transparent, but there's some things. There's a couple of things you told me I should not share. (laughs) Oh, well... I think we all have those. I think youthful mistakes are best, you know, just left in <laughs> yes, youth. Yes, <laughs> definitely close the book on youthful mistakes, although they're very funny at dinner parties sometimes. Perhaps, yes. All right. I hope you all have a great day. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.